Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are ill-treated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honoured by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid, what can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit to those who do so. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the holy people through people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For, for here, we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. <coughs> through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips that openly professes his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Pray for us. We are sure that if we have a clear conscience and desire to live honourably in every way, I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. Now, may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every, everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation, for in fact I have written to you quite briefly. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Greet all your leaders and all the Lord's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. Grace be with you all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As your, um, as your series in the book of Hebrews, Jesus is Better, uh, draws to a close this morning, I just want us to think back for a moment uh, over the whole flow of the book. Uh, if indeed it is a book, or a letter. Some people say they think it sounds more like the transcript of a sermon. Either way, Jesus has been shown to be better. Now, see if I can do this. Yes, technology. Jesus has been shown to be better, better than a lot of things, better than angels in chapters 1 and 2. Why? because they are messengers, that's what angel means, but he is the message, the message of good news. Better than Moses in chapters 3 and 4. Why? Because law, Moses gave the law, but Jesus fulfilled the law, the only one ever to fulfill the entire law. Better than priests in chapters 5 to 7. Why? Well, the priests interceded for the people, but they themselves were sinful people. He sits the sinless Son of God at the right hand of God interceding for us there. And better than sacrifices, that was chapters 8 to 10. The sacrifices were made day after day after day. His was the sacrifice made once for all. And so by the time we got to, or by the time you got to, chapters 11 and 12, the message was to follow this Jesus, this Jesus who is better. Follow him in faith and holiness, and covenant. We take our example from those who've gone before us. There's the big sweep through where we've been, or where you've been, 
And now we come to chapter 13, the final chapter. We're presented now with a practical outworking of all that's gone before, a practical outworking for the original author's audience, those first century Christians, followers of Jesus, who most likely came from a Jewish background rather than a Gentile one. And as we see the applications here of the book's teaching to them in their day, we want to look for its application to us today, because that's what the Bible does. It's written in context, but its guide writer is God the Holy Spirit, and he applies his scripture to us today. So we will unashamedly look at the scripture today to see not just what it said then, but what it says now to us today. The title Alistair has given for this final study is Jesus Makes Life better. So I want us to look through five different windows in this chapter as to how Jesus makes life better. There they are briefly on screen. I want us to look at love, hospitality, and compassion. I want us to look at the law and our hearts. I want us to look at leadership and example. I want us to look at lives lived sacrificially. And then back to leadership again, to leaders and the led. That's our plan of action. Uh, it's a whole big chapter. We can't cover everything that's in it, and we need to get our skates on even to cover these five areas. But let's do that. Let's do that now as we work our way through chapter 13. So love, hospitality, and compassion. Verses 1 to 3. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are treated as if you yourselves were suffering. What does the author want us to do here? He wants us to look outward, not inward. Regarding those around us in the church, um, he, he, there is a reminder that they are brothers and sisters. Now, that's really quite important. You see, trusting in Christ has brought them in their day and us in our day into a family. Now, what does that mean? Well, let me give a negative definition. We've been brought into a family, not into a club or a society. That's not what church is. We're not drawn together because we support the same team. We're not in a club. We're not brought together because we have the same interests. We're not in a society. We've been brought into a family. We're to rub along together. And the only way we can do that is to love one another. Subtext, merely liking others is not enough. For we'll never like everyone, will we? Not really the case, but we can love everyone. So my first question when I read these opening verses is, how am I doing in those stakes? Are there people in my life, are there people in my church, are there people in your church that you need to show love to, that maybe you're not showing love to? Think of the person that actually you find quite difficult. You bump off them a bit. How can you love them? They're brothers and sisters, and we're together in a family. But interestingly, also, as we look out, um, as, as well as those nearby that we see, there are those who come in. The, the author describes them as strangers to us. What do we understand by strangers? Well, here's one view of strangers. When the House of Commons goes into private session. It's not meeting at all at the moment because of the election. But when it goes into private session, which it hasn't done for over 20 years, the traditional call to clear that public gallery is this. Someone calls out, I spy strangers. And that means get them out. When the speaker, maybe you've seen this on television, when the speaker in his gown parades through the central lobby, as he does every day, or she does when it was uh, a few years ago. Um, the police officer on duty cries out, hats off, strangers. 
And if you're there um, as a member of the public, a mere pleb like you or me, you must doff your hat if you're wearing one as the speaker goes past. A clear distinction between the elite and the hoi polloi. But in the church, there is to be no such distinction. Far from it. Indeed, strangers are to be welcomed in and shown hospitality. You folks are here all the time, but some people just come in occasionally. They are the most important people. Welcome them and show them hospitality. Now, some of us are able to do that in wonderful ways. Some of us might say to them, come home for a meal, you know, and, and you open your home, and that's, that's just that you've got a real gift of hospitality, and that's wonderful. Um, please continue to do that. Others of us are, are able simply to, to, to smile and say good morning, and that's about the limit of kind of how, we're, how, you know, how we welcome people, but that's really important. Just a smile, just a welcome, good morning. The call is to engage. Why do I pause on that? Well, I want to pause because I know there will be people in the room who who say, I just find that a bit difficult, actually. I get that, because some of you will be like me. Some of you will be introverts. And actually just going up to other people that you've never met before, it's really hard work, actually. Some of you are sitting there going, what do you mean? It's just, you just do it. Yeah, you're an extrovert. Congratulations. Okay? But some of us find it really hard. Yet somehow it seems that the expected way of doing church can be sometimes much more suited to extroverts than to introverts, but we're all one in Christ Jesus. So is there a get-out clause here? Introverts just stay in the background? No. As introverts, we must do what we can. Others will find it easier, for sure. Others will do more, we know. But here's a word to them. They are not the standard setters. Okay? Their abilities are given to them by God, and it's wonderful that they use them, and they're right to use them to the full. But they're not to be flaunted or far less paraded as the standard for other people to reach. So, introverts, are you off the hook? No. Are you called to do what your extrovert brother or sister does? No. God calls all of us in whatever way we can to love and to show hospitality and also to care for others in more extreme situations, whether they are in prison or being mistreated or whatever. I think the in prison here probably refers much more to people who are in prison for their faith. So let me turn that a wee bit if you're being in prison or being mistreated. Do you know anyone who's having a hard time because they're a Christian? And you're not just now. Well, bless God if you're not. But going to get alongside them. Just be there to comfort them and to help them and to pray with them and to be a support to them. And if you're the one who's having a hard time, you're going to look for it in the church from your brothers and sisters. You have a right to expect that support. Well, let's move on. Let's move on to the second section, to verses four, and four to six. And I've called it, uh, am I going the right direction here? Hold on. I'm going back for some reason. Maybe it's because this is upside down. Some people have the gift of multitasking. There we go. I want to talk about the law and our hearts. For in verses 1 to 3, having advised about what I might call outward conduct, the author now goes on to address what we might call inward conduct. That is, our attitude regarding that from which we might think we will be satisfied if we could only have more. These verses, I think, verses 4 to 6, read a little bit like references to the law of Moses. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not covet. Is that law still for us? Oh, yes, it is. And more so 
It should be written on our hearts, not just on a bit of stone we can go and refer to. This is what uh, Jeremiah, the Old Testament prophet, said about a time which has now come. This is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. This is uh, Jeremiah chapter 31. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. So now the emphasis is on what is in our hearts and how it is then outworked in our lives. So what will prevent marriage from being honored? Verse 4. Surely it is the desires first conceived in our hearts and then acted upon to take more than we have been given. Sexual behavior beyond our marriage, if we are married, and sexual immorality more broadly. Now, it is important to honor marriage. It's absolutely clear. Marriage should be honored by all, not just by those who are in a marriage. But I want to just go off on a tangent very slightly, just for a moment. Because I want to caution that while we honor marriage in the church, we must be careful not to idolize it. The church is a family of brothers and sisters. It's not a club for married couples and families. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters, we're told in verse 1. So as we all, whether married or single, as we all honor marriage, we should be careful not to treat it as the expected norm when believers, saved individually by grace, gather together in churches. If we are single, then there should be an equal place for us in church. If we are married, we should not be proud of the big club of similar people which we belong to in the church. Rather, again, we should love, respect, and engage with one another as brothers and sisters. Take a look around your congregation and work out if there are two churches here or one. Then secondly, what causes a love of money? Verse 5, keep your lives free from the love of money. What causes a love of money to take hold? Surely it is the desires, first conceived in our hearts and then acted upon, to gain more than we have been given. Loving money and putting the pursuit of it as a higher priority than our pursuit of God himself, who the author reminds us in verse 5, will never leave us nor forsake us. Many stories have you heard of people who have made a fortune and lost it? When you gain God, you'll never lose him. He will never leave us nor forsake us. So what is living free from the love of money and content with what we have? Verse 5. What does that look like? Well, if blessed with much, we should be prepared to share it with others. Not about getting and getting and getting for ourselves. It's thank you, Lord, for what I have. How may I use it? How may I push it back out there? to bless others. And by the way, if we have little in the way of money, that's hard. But there can be a temptation to be a wee bit proud of our situation, as if we're somehow more holy because of it. It's just the path God has asked you to walk. It may be a harder path than other people. But look for the other blessings that he has for you. It's not that we should seek to be without money or not increase the amount of money that we have if we can. But we need to be coming on our knees before God and saying, well, what do you want me to do in my circumstances? And I thank you for my circumstances, even if it's hard to thank you. We're all blessed in different ways, you know. Money, housing, Husband or wife, children, grandchildren, multiple gifts and talents, or maybe just one or two. But let's just be aware that in any of our situations, pride can step in. Look back again at verses, verses 2 and 3. Are we using our gifts to express hospitality 
to provide for those in prison, to improve the situations of those being mistreated. And let me ask you a question that will help you to work out if you are, at least just in the congregation. How well do you know the person sitting in front of you? Or behind you? Or next to you? Do you know their circumstances? Do you know what is required in their lives to bless them? Do you know what God has given you that you might explicitly be able to bless them? Or do you just sit in church? You see, with a a settled, realistic view of life and all God's blessings, we can all reach out to help others, knowing that, as verse 6 puts it, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. Well, let's move on. I think this is thirdly, but I've actually lost count. It's verses 7 and 8 anyway. I've called verses 7 and 8 leadership and example. For as we move into verses 7 and 8, we move from conduct, outward and inward, we move from conduct to example. Now, when this letter was written, those were the early days of the church, and there is not a huge amount, I guess, of history and tradition built up for them. Maybe that was a blessing. But what there was was sound teaching from sound leaders. But it's probable, when we read this letter carefully, it's probable that some of these leaders had died. Verse 7, remember your leaders, past tense, rather than keep on remembering or thinking about them. Those leaders had spoken the word of God. In other words, they'd ministered truthfully and faithfully as they'd brought the gospel of the, to the people and built them up as followers of Jesus. But now it seems likely that some of them had been promoted to glory, as we sometimes say. Some of them had died. But the people were to remember them. I wonder who you remember. Who has influenced you over the years? Perhaps even in your youngest years as you made your first steps towards and and into a life of faith. Was it a parent? Was it a Sunday school teacher? A leader at SU camp? A pastor or an elder? Well, the sound advice in verse 7 is that we should consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Who do you think of? It's right to look for these practical examples. Do you thank God for them? When you're unsure what to do, do you think about what they would have done and then do it? Of course, no matter how good they are, leaders come and leaders go. The author here is talking about those who have already died. When I think back, the two names that come to my mind immediately when I consider leaders who who have influenced me in coming to faith, they're both now in heaven. But our author takes this moment to remind us that there is one who was there for us, is here for us, and will be there for us, none other than the Lord Jesus. It's right to think back to people we've known. But it's more right, if I may put it that way, to look up and to thank the Lord for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. He was their Lord. Is He your Lord? And in the future, He will be the Lord of others. The one whom our respected leaders have proclaimed and trusted through all of life is surely worthy of our trust as well. Remember your leaders, but cling to Jesus Christ. I want to pause for a minute and just ask you a question. I wonder if you've made that link. Maybe there are people in this church that you look up to and admire for their faith. I know that donkeys years ago when I was a teenager and just beginning to dabble with faith, there were people I really liked and really respected And I thought that if if I liked them, and if I spent time being with them, if I kind of imitated the way of life, and it was a good way of life to imitate, if I aspired to be like them, then that would make me just like them. That would mean I was a Christian too. 
I couldn't have been more wrong. I needed to trust completely, but not in them, but in the Savior that they had. It wasn't these leaders that I had to follow, even though they gave me a good example. It was Jesus I had to follow. And that meant first and foremost acknowledging something that's actually quite difficult to acknowledge for any of us. Frankly, I was nowhere in respect of Jesus. You see, I needed him to forgive my sin so that I could have not just a way of life, but life itself in him. Maybe you need to take that step as well. The title that's been given to this last sermon in the Hebrews series is Jesus Makes Life Better. That's true. But I want to give a word of caution. Don't, whatever you do, don't come to Christ if you just want a better life. More success, more money, more friends, more years. A nice church where you feel you belong. Jesus isn't an accessory to boost your life to something better, like a new car or new clothes or a pay rise at work. Jesus makes life better because Jesus brings life to us. When we are not following Christ... When you read the Bible, you cannot avoid this distinction of not following Christ, following Christ. There's a distinction there all the time. There's lots and lots and lots and lots of things written in the Bible about this. And some of them use language that is actually quite offensive. And that's one of the things I want to talk to you about this morning. I'm going to jump out of Hebrews for a second. For those of you who like to to travel your way through the Bible, it's right that you should. Ephesians 2 is actually where I'm going to. Because in Ephesians 2, we, you and me, when we're not following Christ, are described using a very strong four-letter word. We're dead, it says. We're dead in our transgressions and sins. Now, what are they? Well, transgressions is when you do things that are wrong, actively doing things that are wrong. Sin... Uh, sin is when you fall short of the mark. There's a standard that God sets and you aim for it and boom, you fall short. You just can't meet his standard. The Bible says when we're not following Christ, we're dead in our transgressions and sins in which we used to live. Get that distinction again? He's saying there's a camp over here and there's a camp over there in which we used to live when we followed what? Who? Jesus? No, the ways of the world. When we just sort of said, well, look, let's, let's see what's going on and let's jump in there. That'll be fine. Why will we think it's fine? Because he goes on gratifying, looking after, sorting out, pleasing the cravings of our flesh, uh, ourselves. That's what Ephesians 2 says about us before we come to Christ. So how does Jesus make life better? Jesus makes life better because he revives us from that death and actually gives us life. I have a simple question for you. Where do you stand today? Which camp are you in? You can't read the Bible but see that there are two camps. Some people talk about sitting on the fence. You can't sit on the fence. You're either that side or this side. Where are you, honestly? Which camp are you in? And let me be even more bold, and you can, you can have a go at me later for putting it this way if I'm annoying you. But, and I say this particularly to people who've maybe been here quite a while. If you haven't yet done so, isn't that about time you came to the Savior that you've seen your leaders here follow? You've heard the gospel a thousand times from this pulpit. Isn't it time? Isn't it time to say, I want to move from death to life? You think Jesus can't do that for you? He just did it for the previous generations? What does verse 8 say? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today 
and forever. Well, now let's move on. Let's come to uh, verses um, 9 to 16. And I've talked, uh, headed this up as lives lived sacrificially. One of the key messages of the book of Hebrews has been that Jesus is better than all the sacrificial system of the old covenant. You know, the priests would go in uh, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, um, continually offering sacrifices for people's sins. And, and by the way, this point is crucial. Before they did that, they offered a sacrifice for their own sin because they weren't special. They just had robes on. <laughs> they were just the people like the other people. Uh, they, were, they weren't sinless. He just had a different role. But Jesus, when he came, by contrast, was the perfect sacrifice. He went to the cross as the sinless Son of God. Well, now, in these verses 9 to 16, the author points out, and this is no contradiction, the author points out that sacrifice, although finally made for our sin, nevertheless, sacrifice should remain a visible, present factor in our daily life. No longer the offering of animals and birds and no longer the pouring out of blood. All that's been superseded by Jesus. No, today's sacrifice shall be one of praise, verse 15, and service, verse 16. So what does that look like in practice? It means doing something that is counter-cultural to the culture we live in today. I think I'm right in saying, tell me if you think I'm wrong that the culture we live in today is a self-serving culture. Me first. We need to be sacrificial in what we do. We need to say, not me first, but something else. So, for example, is it easier to watch a drama on Netflix than go out to the prayer meeting? Will we sacrifice our time and energy to pray and praise God and intercede for others? Or will we go, actually, you know, I like that. I just want to put my feet up. It's been a hard day. Sacrificial giving. What if we're a parent and bringing up kids? Will we determine to be a good witness to our children every day? That's hard. And will we lead them in the development of their faith? Or is it easier to just let them bump along like the rest of the kids down the street? Aye, but we take them to Sunday school. That's okay. It's really sacrificial giving to be a Christian parent. You're willing to make the sacrifice. You're willing to get others alongside you to do it together with you, to help you. Now, there are other parents here that you can, you can support and gain support from as you sacrifice your time and your energy. It's not just to bringing up kids, but to bringing them up in the fear of the Lord. To bringing them up in the fear of the Lord. And will we share with others from all that God has blessed us with? Verse 16 tells us that God is pleased with such sacrifices. Do not forget to do good and to share with others. Now, all of those things, of course, are individual. But what about collectively, as a congregation at Fernie Hill? I mean, this is a splendid new uh, extended space God has given you. I remember the First time I came in here, about it was a year ago or something, and saw it. And I thought, wow, this is great. You've been blessed by God. Uh, I'm sure there are ways that you are using it to bless others. Verse 16 again, do not forget to do good and to share with others. What new opportunities do you have with a space like this? Jesus is better than the old sacrifices. There's no doubt about that. But Jesus calls us today to sacrificial living. Finally, then, the last section from verses 17 to the end, which I've entitled Leaders and the Led. Leaders and the Led. For finally, in this section, the author talks about harmony in the church. Yes, he talks of submission to leaders. All the leaders think that's a great verse. Yes, that's great. But you know, that's not the be-all and end-all. Leaders must not think that they are the bosses, because you're not. Members must never feel that they're being put upon by the leaders in the church. So let's read this verse carefully. Look at verse 17. Notice how the sentence begins. It does not begin with submit to your leader's authority. It begins 
by addressing the members of the church and telling them to have confidence in their leaders. You see, the burden is on the leaders. The burden is on the leaders to lead in such a way that members will have confidence in you. Then, having confidence in you, the members will feel able and willing to submit to you. Knowing that they will be loved as much as they are directed, and knowing that the direction will be God-honoring more than self-serving. For this, leaders, you will be accountable to God. And your accountability, your accountability members will be measured in part by the joy experienced by your leaders as they give lead in this congregation. Their role is not to cope with just how awkward members can make life for them. It's a relationship. We are brothers and sisters. So there it is, I guess. Time is going. That's a scalp through chapter 13. And you've just come to the end of a fairly short series going through the whole book of Hebrews. What have we seen? Jesus is better. Better than angels, because they were messengers, but he's the message. Better than Moses, because he gave the law, but Jesus fulfilled the law. Better than um, priests, because they would intercede as sinful people, but he is the sinless son of God interceding at the throne of God. And better than sacrifices, because sacrifices had to keep coming every day, but his sacrifice was once for all. And though none of the giants of the faith in chapter 11 knew of Jesus, they all looked forward in faith to a new and better covenant. Friends, we now live under that better covenant. In the reality of the coming, living, serving, dying, and rising of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. How then can it not be that Jesus makes life better? For he brings life. He said when he was on earth, I am the resurrection and the life. So my mind turned yesterday to, how do you end a sermon that's the end of a series, at the end of a book that's got so much in it? And I thought, blessing and praise is right. In a moment, we'll sing together, and I asked for the the last hymn to be, Jesus, the name high over all, because Jesus is better. But meantime, as a visitor among you, and as a stranger, I'd like to pray for you, and then to bless you using the very words that are here in verses 20 to 21. So will you pray with me? Our God and our Father, we thank you and we bless you that your Son willingly came to take away our sin. We think of him, Jesus, the name high over all, the name before which angels and men and women fall. That is right, for we bow in worship of God Most High. We thank you for Jesus, the name to sinners dear, the name to sinners given, that he did not come for an elite, but he came for those who were separated from him. We thank you that our guilty fear is scattered, our hell turned to heaven. Oh, we long that the world might taste and see the riches of his grace, and we ask for your helping and enabling as we go out to this corner of the world in which you've placed us to share the riches of his grace with those around about us. Thank you that it's more than a lifestyle that we have, but a righteousness given to us, his only righteousness I know. 
take hold of that. And we commit ourselves to these words. Thee I shall constantly proclaim, though earth and hell oppose, bold to confess thy glorious name before a world of foes. And now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.